Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the Legacy Finance Committee meeting to order. Uh, welcome, big day. Um, I'd like to move the minutes for uh, Vice Chair Hussein. Have you had an opportunity to look at the minutes for the, um, what's the date? April 12th uh, meeting of the Leg Legacy Committee. I look into April 12th and I move the minutes. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Hussein. Any questions regards to the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? The minutes are approved. Thank you, Vice Chair Hussein. Um, so, I'd like to, uh, um, I think we're going to start off. I'll move that House File uh, um, 4124 be re referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. And so, we're moving the uh, Committee Bill today and uh, glad everybody's here and a uh, big day. We got a full full house as well. And uh, we also have a, a, a DE2 amendment that I'd like to uh, uh, essentially get the bill in shape that we can discuss it then. And uh, so I'd like to move the DE2. Any, any discussion to, the, to that? S seeing none, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. So we have a amended uh, uh, bill. And I also have an author's amendment, uh, the A1, and that's in your packets, and and uh, and that's also to get it in shape so we can have further discussion. So any questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. So um, now, now we have the bill before us for the committee, and... Uh, and we've uh, in invited our star staff here from nonpartisan to kind of go through the bill and and then uh, at the end of uh, all that we'll certainly have uh, opportunity to have questions from members and, <laughs> and that so mr. Hagemeyer yep. mr. chair I'll start walking through the spreadsheet um, it's titled legacy finance committee HF 4124 de2 the date and time stamp in the bottom right corner is 414 at 851 p.m. On the first page, the first couple of pages, is the Outdoor Heritage Fund, and this has been heard a couple times in committee, so I'm not going to go through each project. I'll just point out on line, on the third page, on line 111, is the Protecting the Upper Mississippi, uh, Upper Mississippi River from Invasive Carp. That is the barrier project, and that is what the amendment was just adopted to for $12 million. That is included here, which was a supplemental recommendation from the Council. On line 119, you'll see the total appropriation from the Outdoor Heritage Fund is $192,711,000, which leaves just over a 5% reserve in the fund. Um, I'll go on to the Clean Water Fund next. That's on page four. Under the Department of Agriculture, there's $1 million for nitrates and groundwater. And then line 129 and 130 is the Ag BMP loan program for $3.402 million. And I should note the carve out in there I had the reverse number in it. The carve out for Southeast Minnesota should be the $3 million and then the 200,000 or 400,000 is to the overall program. That'll be corrected on the next version of the spreadsheet. In total, there's 4.4 million for the Department of Ag. Next is the Pollution Control Agency. You have river and lake monitoring and assessment for 326,000. Enhanced county inspections and SSTS corrective actions for 2 million. The chloride reduction program of has a $1 million appropriation, and then there's continuous nitrate sensor network for $2 million. In total, there's $5.3 million for the Pollution Control Agency. Under the Department of Natural Resources, on line 139, there's one appropriation to increase the um, amount of money going to the fish contamination assessment for $90,000. On line 141 is the Board of Water and Soil Resources. There's working lands floodplain easements for $4.4 million critical shoreland protection permanent conservation easements for $4 million. On line 144 is the Watershed Partners Legacy Grants Program. There's $2 million. And then new in this bill, you'll see there's a $500,000 tar uh, carve out of that appropriation for targeted rain garden grant program. And then on line 146, there's $1 million for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. And that's $11.4 million going to the Board of Water and Soil Resources. On line 148 is the Department of Health. There's two appropriations. The first is for drinking water contaminants of emerging concern at 384,000. 
And then on line 150 is, the south, is Southeast Minnesota nitrate response at uh, 2.79 million. In total, there's 3.1 million going to the Department of Health. There's one appropriation for $1 million to the U of M, and that's for stormwater BMP performance evaluation and technology transfer. In total, there's 25.46 million being spent out of the Clean Water Fund, and that brings the fund to exactly a 5% reserve. Starting in the bottom of page four is the Parks and Trails Fund, and you'll see the appropriations start on the fifth page. At the top of the page, you'll see the 3.6 million for state parks, recreation area, and trails. And then there's 1.8 million for the Greater Minnesota Regional Parks and Trails. And generically, this bill appropriates under the 40-40-20 split. But once you get to the Met Council on line 169, you'll see the total is the same at 3.6 million, but there are two um, appropriations being made that are not in the general pot of money. There's one 181,000 for free and reduced cost activities for youth and low income users, and that represents pr approximately 5% of the new funding. And then there's $250,000 for fishing pier construction and improvements. In total, there's 9.1 million being spent out of the Parks and Trails Fund, and that brings it to a 5% reserve. Starting on line 183 is the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. On line 186 is the State Arts Board, and you'll see the three appropriations that are usually under three pots of money uh, going to the State Arts Board. And in total, it is 47% of the new funds are going to the State Arts Board for in total 5.7 million. On line 194 under the Historical Society, you'll see a $50,000 grant to the Litchfield Opera House, uh, 287,000 to the Dakota County Historical Society. Uh, there's 500,000 to the Pullman Company Justice Ramsey Stone House. There's 300,000 to statewide historic and cultural grants to commemorate 50 years of South Southeast Asians in Minnesota. And then there's 200,000 for community commemoration program celebrating 50 years among Americans in Minnesota. And then the, on line 199 is Minnesota Military and Veterans Museums, the USS Ward number no. three gun in World War II display for 275,000. In total, there's 1.6 million going to or through the Minnesota Historical Society. On line 201 is the Department of Administration. Uh, the first appropriation is 200,000 for the Burger Fountain met renovation. On line 203 are veterans memorials and commemorations for $100,000 for a competitive pot, but there's two car votes. On line 204, the VFW post 5252 in Pelican Rapids for the honor wall. And then there's on the next page, a $15,000 car vote for Clitheroe Township Veterans Memorial in Battle Lake. On line 206 is support of arts grants for incarcerated persons and persons on supervised relief release for 150,000. In total, there's 450,000 going through the Department of Administration. On line 208 is the Humanities Center. There's community identity and heritage grants. Under that, there um, is 214,000 for capacity building. There's $2 million for grants to celebrate to create, celebrate, and teach art, culture, and heritage of a diverse Minnesota communities. And then there's a million dollar car vote of that for community events. And then of that million dollars, there's a grant of 150,000 to provide boxes of essentials to mothers in the state. There's a grant of $100,000 to Neo Muralismo uh, to expand classes and support artists. And a grant to support the art and music of Rondo Days for $100,000. On line 216, there's $250,000 for underrepresented, um, underrepresented groups cultural studies materials. There's $250,000 for the Urban Debate League. There's $100,000 for Monkey Bear. There's $300,000 for Indigenous, Indigenous Roots Cultural Arts Center in Cypherside. Uh, the Croatian Hall appropriations for $195,000. There's a grant for $100,000 for the St. Paul Neighborhood Network, and $1 million for arts and music education learner grants. In total, there's $12.2 million being appropriated out of the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, and that brings it right to a 5% reserve. That's all I have on the spreadsheet, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Hagemeyer and uh, Ms. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I'm going to walk through the DE2 amendment. There wasn't a lot of policy this time around, so I'm just going to point out a few things that maybe aren't reflected in the spreadsheet or that might be a, of interest to the committee. And the first is on page 19. 
This is where um, the original uh, invasive carp deterrent language was, and that's what was replaced with the A1 amendment that was adopted. And then if you want to go to page 24, subdivision 10 on that page, this includes a number of extensions for previous appropriations. One of them is new to the bill from when it was introduced, and that's paragraph C. And then going to the next page, Article 2, this is the Clean Water Fund. We can skip ahead to page 29. And I just wanted to point out the new car vote for grants to watershed districts for um, rain gardens. That was in the uh, spreadsheet. This is new language that hasn't been in previous bills. So, just, And that's on lines 21 through 31 or 32. And we can skip ahead to 31. This is the start of Article 3, which is the Parks and Trails Fund. If you go to page 35, you'll see the new car votes for the Met Council's um, park appropriation. Paragraph C is the new competitive grant program for the reduced cost equipment and facilities for youth and low-income users. And then paragraph D is the, are the competitive grants for the fishing piers. And then we can skip to the next page. Section four provides some extensions of previous appropriations. There's about five of them. And then we get to article four and I'll turn that over to Ms. Davis. Thank you, uh, Ms. Taylor and Ms. Davis. Uh, Chair and members, Mary Davis from the House Research Department. Um, there is not a lot of policy in article four, but I will point out a couple things. Um, one is that the, the appropriations for 2025 are available until June 30th, uh, 2026. And there are a couple of uh, competitive grants programs that are new to this um, biennium. And the first one is for the veterans, um, the veterans memorials and commemorations, which is on page 42. And that's going to be um, done by the Department of Administration. Um, in the humanities um, appropriations, uh, there is a new um, competitive grant program for um, the underrepresented group cultural studies materials, and that's on page 46. And then there's also a new competitive grant program on page 47 um, for the arts and cultural heritage learners grants. Um, and this has a few um, program requirements for, um, you know, uh, priorities for matching grants um, and matching um, in-kind donations, high-quality art programming, scholarships to low-income and diverse communities, um, uh, working with youth in public schools, and um, providing outreach and transportation. And that's pretty much it. Thank you, Ms. Davis and Ms. Taylor and Mr. Hagemeyer. Um, so we have a couple of people that have uh, requested to speak to the, and so I'm going to invite them forward at this time. So um, we have uh, um, Katie Smith. Are you? Yep. And, uh, and then Ms. Lee, you'll be be next so welcome welcome back and uh, go please state your name and go ahead when you're ready please good morning mr. chair members Katie Smith director of the ecological and water resources division at the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources um, DNR is appreciative of the funding for the invasive carp deterrent and will strive to accelerate our work on that but it's important to recognize that the information available on the timeline and the other feasibility considerations is still imperfect at this time the DNR developed an initial draft proposal for LSOHC for this deterrent with input from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It describes actions needed to evaluate, finalize design, confirm feasibility, and obtain required approvals prior to installation of a deterrent, and complementary actions to reduce the upstream passage of invasive carp and removal of invasive carp from the river. Site-specific information will be needed in advance of barrier installation, as there are many engineering, evaluation, and research pieces that must first be explored. 
As part of project scoping, a number of practical considerations would also need to be addressed, including project duration and deliverables, liability during operations, and project operation and maintenance responsibilities. While two years to complete design seems possible, um, what we discovered during that scoping and evaluation design phases could impact the timeline. We will do the very best we can. Um, we have met with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers multiple times in recent weeks for um, information and clarification on approvals, processes, and timelines, but these federal processes are out of our control. Prior to installation, the necessary permits and permissions from the Corps would also need to be secured. Um, our federal partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the U.S. Geological Survey, have stressed that a project would require these careful stages of planning, evaluation, adaptive management, and coordination prior to making a go, no go decision on barrier installation. Um, DNR would need funding to be appropriated in a way that provides flexibility to allow for, for thoughtful execution of these phases of a research and evaluation project recognizing that installation of any type of barrier would only occur if initial research and evaluations of challenges um, warrant, uh, indicates that this is feasible. If it does not appear warranted, we would inform LSOHC and the legislature of our findings and discuss before proceeding with any next steps. Funding should also include the flexibility for the DNR and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to utilize some of the funds for additional critical management activities, <coughs> such as supplemental tagging, tracking, and commercial fishing to remove invasive carp, which is a critical piece of our management strategy and is supported by partners and stakeholders. And in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife's experience with its barrier, operating a deterrent and adding fishing to complement that to remove the deterred fish is the most effective. We look forward to any clarifying language from the legislature. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Smith. Um, uh, do you have, can you stand for a quick question? Uh, yes. Representative Lee, Chair Lee has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Director. Thank you for uh, that, those remarks. So can you just give us a timeline as of right now? Have there been any shared uh, timeline of, you know, what has been communicated from the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife regarding timeline? Is the two years here feasible or is it beyond that? Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, Representative Lee, um, it, it, we have been discussing with the um, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers what that timeline looks like. Um, as recently as this past week. And there are various permits and permissions we'd have to get. And they've given us various timelines for those specific pieces, but they're all in a range. So there's multiple um, approvals that would be needed, and some of them are months up to a year. So all those would need to be completed. So we really don't have an exact date. And then as far as the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, as we proceed toward designing and evaluating and scoping, that will really help us determine what the timeline, timeline might be for that exact design. So those are all the questions that we're working to answer right now. Chair Lee. And then uh, just last question, I think you might have covered this. So operation and maintenance, I know that that's not in the funding here. And so is that part of the consideration for the federal government too, or is that mostly more for after we have been able to do the design, install the deterrent, and all of that. Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, Representative Lee, those are the conversations that we're gonna be having with our federal partners right now. Um, the operation and maintenance could be in the you know tens of thousands of dollars each year, and we have not determined who's gonna be responsible for that and have not identified which funds would go toward that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Smith. And uh, just a quick question. So you said language would be helpful at this time or as we're going through, you know, maybe not today, but through conference committee or, or you're saying now would be helpful or when are you saying the language? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, th I think um, the language regarding the two deadlines is, is, is concerning to us because as I said, we don't have control over a lot of those timelines. Um, and then secondly, if uh, there could be language that was added to allow for supplemental commercial fishing so that the deterrent, as it does its work, um, we could uh, fish out any fish that were deterred um, to remove them from the river would be very helpful. Thank you, Ms. Smith. I guess we have an additional question. From Representative Scraba. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
assistant director or um, um, so who's going to ultimately determine if this is feasible or not? The Army Corps, uh, Fish and Wildlife, DNR. Uh, wh where, where is that? Because now, now I'm hearing you kind of say, you know, we may not even go down the road if we don't think it's feasible. And I, I'm kind of concerned. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Smith. Mr. Chair, Representative Scraba, um, we want to make sure that the site conditions make it feasible to install that. So that's part of the process is the site evaluation. Um, as I mentioned, the Army Corps of Engineers has um, various approvals and permits that must be granted. So we'd have to make sure that those were able to be um, approved in order to move forward. And then part of the, the project would be around the efficacy and determining how much additional benefit um, a barrier would bring. Thank you. Representative Scraba. Real quick. Um, I have personally have worked with the Army Corps on a, moving a boathouse and nine and a half months waiting for a permit was normal, you know. So I know our timeline doesn't account for that. Um, we're talking about a river. Um, but at the same time, these fish can damage our ecosystem forever. I mean, expediency is... Now, I guess that we have just, I just, I just think we need to fast track it or work faster, but thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Heitzman has a, do you have a question? Uh, Mr. Chair, mostly a comment, but if it's okay. 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 We're kind of off the rails here a little bit, but it's good. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to echo some of what uh, Representative Scrava just said, expediting this is obviously on Minnesotans' minds. It's front and center. And so I'm fine hearing that there may be obstacles, but quite honestly, as I've said before, and we've talked privately about this, the people of Minnesota don't care. They want to make sure that Minnesota waters are protected. And they want it done, and they want it done right now. And I could continue on, Mr. Chair. We might talk more about this, I guess, if uh, there's more to add to this conversation, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. And uh, hopefully we see some more positive coming out of uh, this project as some of the <coughs> Thank you. research or work that needs to be done starts moving forward. Thank you, Representative. And we'll, we can have opportunity when we get more into member discussion too as well. But uh, thank you, Ms. Smith and, uh, you know, and Lassard Sams, thank you. Lassard Sams will have opportunity to look at the project as it goes through the and, and believe me, they're going to be paying attention. Miss Lee, yes. welcome. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you. I'm Dr. Jean Lee. I head Children's Open International, which is legal advocacy and public policy. On our family centers are our shelters for bettered women and children. We do uh, transitional and permanent housing, also housing services, health and human services, um, and also APAC, which is a housing consortium. I'm also a former Fortune 500 corporate auditor. I'm a developer, do construction and small business and many other hats in the housing industry. My house was hit by a tornado, but I knew enough and learned enough to know how to rebuild it back with my own hands. So once you teach a person to fish, they can feed themselves forever. I'm also a U.S. Department of Justice first responder, so I helped out in 9-11 in New York in, with Katrina with the 35W Bridge disaster. I'm at the call of the U.S. President and governors. I'm pushing this um, issue as far as the home heroes uh, legacy because it has components that saves lives of families and of children. Um, you have in a handout that some of you got and some of you, you know, were prevented from getting. Uh, it has been emailed to you, so please consider it. Um, I also had a PowerPoint that has more information as far as how uh, people can be helped. So it was also emailed to you, and I ask that it please be considered. Um, we do have supporters like Home Depot, a number of cities and counties, emergency medical service, police officers, firefighters, and the University of Minnesota and a number of nonprofits. 
The issue is we need to be able to educate our children, our families, and our communities about life-saving measures, uh, especially in times of fire. Because what hit me a lot, and I didn't put it in the slide, was the among children that died in the fire and the parent. Lives could have been saved had they known what to do. And there are many situations like that where we need to reach out to them, we need to educate them in the way that they will understand and uh, accept it. And that was the purpose of the Home Heroes Legacy, is so that, and also with medical needs. When you know, when a child knows to call 911 because there's a medical emergency, that saves lives, especially in times of heart attack and stroke. I had a father that died of stroke because nobody knew how to treat it. I had a brother that died of heart attack. Nobody knew how to treat it. These are simple things that people can learn. And that's part of the uh, impetus of uh, pushing for this type of education that's very broad based, reaches a lot of people, and it will capture them and educate them and they can save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lee. And um, maybe I'll have, uh, I'm okay. I don't know what happened with the copies, but you can, I have one. I don't know if everybody wants one or uh, just give them to the page, please, and we'll make sure members get one. Okay, thank you. So, so we're going to kind of transition to member discussion. And, um, you know, this is the second year of the biennium for Legacy. So quite honestly, it's not as exciting as our first year when uh, most of our work is done with the uh, with the bigger bill and the bigger numbers and all the funds. But uh, as you can see, there's some things that we're able to do in all the funds. And there's actually some very exciting things that we're able to do, I think, for in adding some language. And I, I'm actually very excited about the, the, the Lassard Sam's proposals in the, including the bubbler. The clean water has, you know, the council has their recommendations and it's very solid on their on their uh, proposals. We did add a little bit of uh, a tweak for the uh, rain gardens, but uh, really it's, you know, 99.9% .9 of the Clean Water Council. Um, the Parks and Trails is essentially comes from, as you all know by now, it's the formulas are 40, 40, 20. And um, so the greater Minnesota is getting their percentages and, and as, it, as we saw in their presentation, they had some amazing work they're doing and will continue to do with the funds uh, with the extra surpluses and all of these. But, uh, and then DNR, of course, is doing good work and hopefully committed to more to the ICANN program and other things they do with legacy funds. And then in the, uh, the Metro, we did add a few components because there was some concern in this committee about uh, affordability issues for people entering and, you know, maybe going to, uh, Metro facilities, so whether that be golf or uh, renting a bike or trying to make it more accessible, so we've added some of that. And then we know that, and uh, certainly in all over the state, but in the metro, that fishing piers are immensely popular, so we added a small tweak to that to add some more. Um, in the arts, there's uh, we named some new projects. You know, the Senate named about ten, and we named about ten, but there's some. There's some really nice things that we're able to do, and one of them I'm really excited about is, I don't know if you've noticed, in schools they're, they're not uh, able to fund um, arts and music as much in some of our school districts. So there's going to be grants in this bill that will go to disadvantaged people uh, to have scholarships for quality music or quality arts programs. And so I think that's a... It's a great addition, so thank you for staff for working on that. And there's uh, a lot of other uh, good things in the bill. But again, last year is our bigger year, and this is, uh, you know, we had a, we were lucky that we were blessed with a surplus, so we had um, some additional funds and, and things. But I definitely stand for member questions, and um, if there's any, I don't know if there are any. Chair Hurt. 
Uh, Chair Lee, I just wanted to say, Ashley, thank you to you and staff for the hard work that went into this. I think that it is very difficult to really balance the needs of our state uh, when it comes to all the different areas in which legacy covers. And I appreciate the deliberateness and how you've done this work uh, and how staff has been intentional in ensuring that we have all the proper documentation that we need, that we do have, you know, uh, accurate statuses within the Secretary of State and um, and that we do uh, have the supporting information to ensure that we are uh, giving grants uh, appropriately to individuals who can execute on those grants. So I just wanted to say thank you for this and thank you for the, uh, the seriousness and the intentionality of how you and the team do this work. So thank you. Thank you. No further discussion? Okay, well. I I guess I asked too long. No. <laughs> Representative Heitzman. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. And not, not to beat a dead horse, but you did look like you wanted more conversation. You seemed disappointed well. that we weren't going to have more. So I'll just add a few details to uh, what we already were uh, kind of going back and forth over a few minutes ago. So the A1... I just wanted to quickly mention for the benefit of those watching, for everyone in the room, was passed in the Senate this morning. So uh, that language, I think, is something that people are coming around. Um, the timelines that are here, I think there's a lot of agreement that these things um, are, are, these timelines are timelines we can work, work with. And, and Bob Meyer, Assistant Commissioner Bob Meyer was, was testifying in the Senate that they were okay with it. And I get that the installation deadline, at least as he was mentioning it, um, completing by 2029, if there are extenuating circumstances, um, I believe we can work that out. And I don't want there to be any, uh, I don't, I, I'm hoping that those that are tentative about how we're going to address that, if, the, if it should come up, should recognize that those are, kind of, those are the kinds of conversations that we have frequently. And we've had those at the Lassard SAMs um, as we've had to extend uh, project deadlines if there was issues that came up. That is not unusual. Those are things that happen. And this is, a, this is an issue that's serious enough in, the, uh, in that space. I think that people expect us uh, to work through that process and just get the job done. So hopefully, Hopefully there's agreement as we come to the end of session and this project continues to uh, move forward. And I've heard a few comments from time to time over the last few weeks that did leave me wondering if um, the bipartisan support that this, this project has enjoyed, if that was faltering. And I don't think that it will, but uh, I'm just bringing it up again because I know there's a lot of people outside this room uh, as, that care about this issue as well. That's all. Thank you, Representative Heitzman. And, uh... I just want to make a comment that I, I think it is important that we do something, and I, I very much support this, but I, I want to be clear that I, I don't want this lingering. <laughs> I don't want this out, you know, too long. I mean, we, we need to respond, you know, and, and so, you know, so it, it would disappoint me if this money sitting in an account a couple of years down the road and not being used and implemented, so... That's just a comment. Vice Chair Hussein. Thank you, Chair Lee and the staff and the committee members. Uh, this bill was a great bill, and thank you for involving us and, and discussion more. And I want to thank for our staff for has done an uh, outstanding work uh, for this bill and for putting together hours and hours and address a lot of issues that uh, communities and, and based off uh, and I'm glad that we had a, a surplus, and it's not like the, the year ago where we have funded, but this year at least Chair Liddy has done a great job, and, uh, and, and I'm honored to be his vice chair, and I'm honored to support this bill, and, and thank you for bringing it forward. Chair Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, you know, really want to say thank you for your leadership and, you know, bringing us this far with regards to the, the bill that we have in, in front of us. And I think, you know, I'll just comment on the, 
the A1 amendment, and I really appreciate you sharing your sentiments that, you know, this funding should not be sitting there. And, you know, I think that uh, just to some of the other comments around, are we going to do anything or not? And I just want to say, you know, I'm really thankful to the DNR for having their uh, invasive carb action plan that was actually released earlier this year in January 2018. And I think that, you know, the barrier is just one of several uh, categories of actions that we could take at the legislature. And if members actually look at the report, you know, the DNR did a good uh, job of looking at, you know, what is the scope and fis feasibility for design or installing deterrence. And the timeline that they have listed in that comprehensive plan was 2024 to 2028. And so I think that, you know, as we go through the process, I think, you know, this is a decision, you know, the, the, of the body for whether we should uh, fund this or not, but, you know, it's going forward. And so I just want to make sure that, you know, the, the funding will not be sitting there similar to what you have said. And so I really appreciate uh, those comments as we uh, continue to move forward with this process. Thank you, Chair Lee. Mm. Representative Cha, final. Thank you, Chair Lilly. Uh, it's been a pleasure serving on this committee for the session, and thanks for the accommodation. And, um, you know, um, foremost, thank the, the staff members of this committee for your dedication and commitment to excellence. So thank you for that. I just want to touch base on the um, free and reduced cost activities for youth and low-income users. I really appreciate that provision in this bill. And uh, for someone like me who grew up um, with low income, having access to skis and you know activities as such was really, really important. But um, those opportunities never came because we couldn't afford it. And so, you know, today sitting here, seeing this fund uh, being in here for low income family is, is really special. And I hope that those families that do need this do, um, do um, get to utilize it and so they can ski and so they can um, do archery or play golf or whatever it is they wish to do, right? And so I appreciate that for looking for um, after families and children. So thank you. Thank you. So, um with that, seeing no more further comments, I renew my motion that House File 4124 be re referred to the Committee of Ways and Means. And seeing no discussion, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? So our bill is approved, aye. Um, and on its way. I, I, as chair, really want to thank all you. Um, you know, again, this wasn't our big year. But we were really blessed as a state to, to have some money extra to spend on some of these. And there was not appetite in uh, previous pioneers to uh, it sat and then waited to the next year. And, uh, and we, we tried to pass a bill, but I'm hopeful from talking to the senator that we'll be able to do most of not everything that we have in this bill. And, and maybe, you know, we'll see what they add or, or not. Um, but I, I'm really honored to serve with all of you. I, I appreciate you looking back at what we did last year, and we were able to do some amazing things. On a, and Representative Chaw really kind of covered it, you know, for affordability last year, you know, and this year again. We're trying to make it so more Minnesotans can get out and use all these funds, and have access to them. You know, the arts grants, the opening up zoos days, uh, you know, just you know, the affordability of equipment. Um, so, and I really want to thank the people that asked for these funds because they came and we looked at them, this whole biennium, and we looked back. We looked back and really studied how they were spending them, uh, how the historical society was doing their grants and they're doing a good job, humanities, how they're sending out their grants to different groups. It's amazing how many groups that are, new groups are, had traditionally not gotten money that are getting money in these last few years. And so that's a testament. The, the gr amazing work that's being done in Habitat, uh, I don't know if you know the speakers, very interested in trees, and um, we're literally buying a whole forest in this bill. 11,000 acre forest we're buying, we're buying. So I was able to say, hey, we're buying a ton of trees <laughs> and restoring, I mean, just uh, amazing prairie work and trout stream restoration. And the Clean Water Fund, I mean, working with farmers all over the state, we're able to do and continue this. And this bill right now is helping with the, the southeastern Minnesota issue that's going on. And 
there's a bold position by the Clean Water Council and going after that and helping that. Um, and then it's just some amazing things in the arts grants, going to small artists, to big artists. To, um, but anyways, we're very lucky, and I just really want to thank you for all for being on the journey with us. And the people that ask for funds, please keep doing good work. I don't want to be in the news. I want uh, good, good work out there in the community. But my hat's off to staff. Thank you for all that you do, and uh, especially the nonpartisan and the partisan staff, too, is top-notch. But again, thank you all, members. And with that, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.